welcome uh, welcome to you Warren you can now also hear that the recording is in in progress I uh, I'm in Denmark you are down under so there's uh, quite a bit of of time difference I think people will will slowly be uh, be in the call but uh, but thank you uh, thank you very much for joining us for for this Half an hour, we will do a, a quite hard stop at that half an hour, despite I know that, that we could likely be listening to you for um, for hours. So uh, so a, a big welcome on behalf of uh, of Summit, Warren, to, uh, to this call. Thank you, Adam. Great, great to be a part of it. And um, uh, yeah, great, great to be connecting with a beautiful, uh, beautiful Denmark and a beautiful city of Copenhagen. We, uh, we appreciate it. And you... Uh, it's it's evening time down under, and, and we just talked about whether you have had lunch or not lunch, but but dinner yet. And you said yes, and you have calls after this as well. So we we appreciate your time, and also the reason why we uh, we really wanted to to talk to you is as as a company that is in love with Hogan. You are yourself a, a Hogan a Hogan practitioner, a part of the the Hogan coaching network, being extremely experienced using the tool, but also just working in both sports and business psychology. You are at the same time an author of, yeah. of a great book that is one of the reasons why, why you really caught my attention in in terms of talking fit, talking motivation and, and drive. So that is, is one of the prerequisites of us as a company inviting you in to, uh, to not only make the participants wiser, but but also us internally in, uh, in our company. I could um, try to introduce you um, and, and your experience, but I, I'd rather let you say a couple of words of who you are and, and your experience before we get into the round where I start opening up for, for some questions and interview uh, a little bit more. I would also say for the participants in the Q&A function of this webinar, you are able to uh, ask questions of Warren. So I have a multitude of questions prepared, but uh, but you also have the capability of asking questions should you decide to, and then we might get around to them by, uh, by the end of the interview. So Warren, why don't you go ahead and, uh, and just briefly introduce yourself? Thank you, Adam. Um, uh, I've been fortunate enough over the last 30 years to be involved in uh, with, uh, executive development and also working with elite levels of sport and um, uh, been fortunate enough to work with some amazingly incredible people, uh, done some uh, leadership training at Harvard and work with some elite sports people. And, and I suppose over that period of time, what I've, uh, what, I, what I've learned from a personality perspective is that most of us to some degree are very complex, but under the complexity, we're very kind of predictable as to how we're likely to behave, especially when we're looking at um, uh, basically comp completing tasks and tasks within our sport and also tasks within our, uh, tasks within our role. We're pretty consistent over, over time around that which then gives us a real um, indication as to uh, where people are, uh, are likely to be uh, strong in, where they're not likely to be so strong in, and also what relationships they're likely to um, attract and have difficulty with. So it's, uh, it's been a bit of a wild ride over the, last, uh, over the last 30 years, Adam. And you say that, that we as human beings, we are in, in some ways relatively complex, but also quite predictable and one of the things that you might look out for whether it's in in sports or or business is, is the best talents and one of the things that that I, I i find very interesting that you talk about in in your book is well when we obviously want high performers but if true success is not totally dependent on talent and intelligent what might it then be dependable on and I think if I if I if I put a cadence around the you know the talent and um, uh, the talent and intelligence, I, pretty well when you get to the top levels of business or e even to top uh, even to top levels of certain domains within business and certainly top levels of sport, that stuff is already there. They're skilled. They're equipped. Um, they're very good at what they, they're very good at what they do. The, the bit that I found really interesting in the research that I did a few years ago was to what degree that talent is transportable across to another domain. 
Uh, we see it very, uh, very obviously in sport where we have a, a um, you know, super successful athlete in, in one team goes to another team 12 months later is not as successful. Now, I, I was always curious that they haven't lost their technical skills. We see the same in business mm -hmm. where, where I could be, um, you know, amazing in one technology company, same role, go to another company and it just never kind of worked. I was always really interested in about what that, what that was. And look, in a broad terms, it's about culture fit. Uh, we absolutely know from a brain science perspective that if, if I am trying to understand what's going on, that is the predominant focus rather than deploying my skills. So if I'm in an environment where, where I'm confused by my manager, confused by the culture, confused by the subdominant cultures, one would say in big organisations there is no culture, it's all subdominant culture, it's all subtribal. Then, and if, if for some reason I don't fit or I'm challenged with my fit in there, I will predominantly try and work out that question before I actually start to perform. So that that was that was the that was the that was the theory that um, that uh, sent me on an interesting journey for uh, for about three years because uh, the book started out looking at what you know what makes game changes what makes uh, um, sport and corporate game changes where's the rainmaker um, and through my work with Hogan um, you know of course finding out that uh, there was no statistical difference between all the rainmakers that I provided profiles for for research. Um, uh, and, and, and then kind of being forced to look elsewhere. And um, it, it's been a real revelation finding out that the, that the talent doesn't change, but it, in the context of which it's, 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 it's embarked on and invited into makes all the difference. So, so what I um, let me know if I'm interpreting this wrong, but but what I hear you talk into is that the fit is is more important necessarily than the talent or the intelligence. Would that be a correct assumption? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 now, look, if you've got, if you've got if you've got no talent, then, then 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 the game's over, right? So, you know, assuming you know, assuming that the talent is equal, the the, the fit wins every time. I, I would almost go assuming that even that the talent is slightly subordinate in one area, mm. that the, the fit can elevate, it can, you know, can elevate the talent. So it's very much about context. It's very much about am I feeling comfortable? Am I feeling understood? Are my values met? And I think from a Hogan perspective, those of us that are Hogan accredited, there is an enormous, an enormous richness in the MVPI. In, in, in my world, the majority of the answers are in the MVPI. The 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 the, the personality inventory, the the HPI, very much so about how I'm likely to behave and will behave on a on a normal day. Most of us know that about ourselves. We've got inklings about our derailing behaviours. You know, if we've got any experience at all, if we're you know if we're if we're somewhat mature in our years, we would know what we do to to derail ourselves. But it's the it's in the values that that um, are really the richness is where the treasures are. And and as you said, we we have uh, listeners today that are both someone are uh, accredited and, and certified, some are looking into potentially being it. We have three different assessments in, in the Hogan assessments, as you said, we got the HPI, the yellow part, day-to-day -day personality, when we are at our best, the HDS, the red part, dark side personality, when we're under stress or at our worst, and then the, the blue MVPI that is more on, on motivational factors, Founder of uh, of Hogan, Bob, uh, have sometimes uh, when when I've, I've spoken to or not me speaking to him, but when we've had the pleasure of him here in Denmark, he has introduced Hogan as all the three different assessments as the yellow being the person that you date. You see all of the bright sides of the yeah. the person, the red as the person you marry. You get to see the full range of the human being, and then right. the blue right. motivational factors as whether whether you stay together or not. Yes. So, so the blue motivational factors is something talking into to the fit in terms of do we fit into the organization, but likely also something around, well, what will we be the, the co-creator of? So a, a question from my side would also be, well, it might not the culture that you get into be, be a perfect fit, but how much can you make up for that with what you co-create yourself when you get into a company culture? 
Uh, what, what a great question. And, and um, my, my learning and, and um, what I try and pass on to people is almost to hold their values a bit loosely. Because otherwise it's going to be otherwise it's going to be difficult, isn't it? I mean, you know, if every you know if I, if I demand that 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 either you're aligned with my values, um, that that's very narrow in the organisations, the opportunities, the context that I can work in. Now, what we also know ideally is is that um, um, and we're very strong on diversity now. Diversity, in my opinion, works is when we value the difference in each other. Mm. So if very, very simply, if I'm the big picture person, Adam, and you're the detail person, and I can, and you could kind of go, Warren, you've got the ideas, I can make them work. We're, we're fantastic. You know, one plus one equals five. Mm -hmm. But the moment that we get annoyed with the fact that my ideas are crazy and never work, and by the way, you're too organising your pencils, uh, you know, too many times in doing your shoes in a double knot, um, the, the moment that we the moment that we don't value the the moment that we oppose the differences, it's pretty well done. And I think that that's true not just in in corporate and not just in sport, uh, but very much in personal relationships too. We tend to be attracted to the opposite in our personal relationships on the basis of that they have the piece that we miss. Mm. I, I think unconsciously that's what we're attracted to. And, but the moment that that piece that I'm missing becomes annoying and I start to judge and rile against that, we're done, right? It, we might not be done today, but long term, that's done. So I think it's a real challenge around. I, what, what I do know is that people that, that are diametrically opposed in values find it very, very difficult to find common ground. It's almost the work is to find the common ground. Mm. And on a good day, we can do that. On a bad, on, on an okay day, we can't. On a bad day, we certainly can't. So those relationships are too much effort. I'm sure we've all had experience of that, um, either in our personal life or in our business life or in, in the versions of our life. And it, it just gets too hard because the work is actually to find the common ground. You know, ideally, what we want to do is we want to we want to walk into an environment where there's lots of common ground where I feel understood, where you're understood, and then we can start deploying skills. But again, the, the challenge with that, Adam, is, is that that can be a very narrow, you know, if my criteria is only to work with people like myself, um, you know, quite narcissistic in some ways, but uh, uh, if, that, if that's a goal, then it'll work fine. But, you know, what percentage of people are actually like that is probably very narrow. We, uh, Warren, we, we have uh, a question from, uh, from one of, of the listeners, uh, Juliana that is is talking into you mentioned the the critical importance of cultural fit but in a world where we are talking equity inclusion diversity she's also talking into well might when we're talking about cultural fit might that inadvertently exclude candidates who could contribute to a greater degree of diversity within the company what would your thoughts or reflections be on that look I, look, I think that's a really great question and I think that um, uh, Juliana makes a really great point I think that when there is um, I don't want to say respect of that diversity but when there is um, an, an embracing of that diversity a tolerance of the difference an inquiring mind a curiosity there is absolutely no doubt that that is that is all the good news that we're trying to achieve. As human beings, my experience is we're fairly, you know, we're fairly limited in our ability to flex and give up our position of rightness. And bearing in mind that, you know, if we talk the, the motives, values and preferences inventory, which I think is a lovely measure of intrinsic values, that is my way of navigating the world. And I, I do not have another way of navigating the world. Now, if I, if I can be looser on my values and actually be more curious and more inviting, then that presents an opportunity. Uh, there was a really great quote that I read the other day that the three most loved wor words in the world are, you are right. And, and I, I wrote a little, I think it was a tweet or a LinkedIn post that basically said, if that's the case, you should say that a lot to others and request it not a lot of yourself. Well, one question, Warren, that, that might be a little bit of a leading question, but post-corona, um, we are, for instance, we're doing this online. We're in different time zones. It is increasingly becoming 
uh, possible to to work in uh, not only locally or nationally, but also working remotely across different countries, time zones, etc. Has has the what the MVPI is an answer to in terms of what is driving you and and what is valuable to you, what is meaningful to you? Has that increasingly become more important in order to have someone sustainably perform at a workplace? Look, look, look! I think so. I think there's, I think there's no doubt that that, that if we talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the, the COVID as a time frame versus versus a um, uh, versus an event. Um, so if we talk about that period. I think it was a great accelerator to everything that was going on. I think it forced us to, we, you know, we were talking about flexibility prior to that. We were talking about uh, different modes of working prior to that. We were talking about greater connectivity prior to that. I think, you know, that that period of time for you know, 2020 to 2022, let's say, has been a great accelerator of that. And I think it's, I, 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 I think it's shone a light on um, uh, non-traditional ways of kind of doing things. I think with the evolution now coming, absolutely no doubt of um, artificial intelligence, that um, everything that I read, that will be the greatest thing since the printing press in the next 10 years and probably beyond. So I think that, um, uh, we, we will be seeing things and doing things that we that we had not that we had not expected. I'm not sure our values change a lot around that. I think uh, you know I think the, the the you know how how I believe I should operate in the world and my model of operating in the world is probably we 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 know from the research perspective the values tend not to change, and and if they were to change, they just change to something else, and they've got problems there too. They've got strengths and problems with that too. So I don't say it's a net zero sum game as far as that goes. We know from 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 the research that some personality elements like uh, calmness, you know, indicated in the adjustments scale, that's quite important. And if you can change that, then that makes you uh, more employable, more appealing. Prudence is another one around that. Um, sociability in some degrees, the ability to connect and make new relationships depending on your role. But, you know, what we know is, is that, um, you know, to some degree that, you know, the values are the values. And uh, there's, there's, you know, absolutely no doubt the people that, are, that love to be autonomous are found, uh, you know, found working from home and moving, you know, moving to another country, to another area, very liberating. Um, uh, of course, and, and rightly so, you know, employers do tend to want people together, you know, back in a, uh, uh, back in a face-to-face -face environment again. So it's been, been interesting, the power shift that's actually gone on from, from 2019 to 2022, let's say, and now, you know, the wrestle that goes on from uh, 2023 onwards. So I'm just uh, taking a little bit of a pause here, Warren, because there was just another question. Just wanted to to read what it, it actually were, was saying. It's again touching upon the the values uh, fit in terms of of alignment across a larger organization. And the question is is from Anne on well well how do we figure out or how do we determine when there's not a, a good fit anymore. Oh, I think Ian, Ian asked a really great question, and I'm not sure. That, no, I'm not sure that there's an easy answer for. It's interesting. I'm working with a, a gentleman at the moment who's taken up a very large position um, uh, in an English bank, and I've just taken his uh, MVPI, and he's he's rebuilding his team, and wrote. Uh, I, and that's this. I'm not doing it justice as I put it. Almost a personal brand statement for him, so that we can see that that. We can quickly ascertain where the people who will report to him can do the job. That's not difficult to do. It's based on history, reference checking, um, uh, past credibility, credentials, uh, qualifications, etc. And I've actually put together a statement for him to say, look, you need to go away and have a think about if you can work in this environment. You're going to get a lot of feedback. There's, there's real transparency around feedback, both good and bad. And sometimes they don't have a really good filter. Um, I'm absolutely believe in that we need to change the world here and what we're doing so our challenges are tough i will care for you if we if we bond through loyalty and research data and logic absolutely trumps everything as we're very very commercially focused and and i'm encourage him to actually ask 
participants. So well done. I think you can do the job. The question is now, can you do it here? And, and taking, his, taking his values data, which interesting, he wrote to me this morning and said, you actually know me better than I know myself. He said, everything you've written is absolutely accurate. And I could not have put that in words like that. And so I've encouraged him to actually use that as a opportunity for consideration for people who, who, who want to work under his leadership and in his shadow. Now, Ian might ask the question, well, should not, does not he have an obligation to change? And I think, I think the answer is absolutely yes. But he, 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 the leader can change within a, cert, within a certain degree, depending on how many direct reports. They can't become multiple schizophrenic personalities just for everyone. And, and we, we, we know, you know, from a values perspective, we can only change so far. Hmm. So I think his ability to actually um, um, ask that as a, uh, a really um, um, honest, uh, vulnerable question uh, and to amplify. So if you like to be under the radar, if you don't like to be challenged, if you like to work alone and you're quite intuitive, you might not get on here. Now, in that extreme, and to go back to, I think it was Julianne's first question, right, is there a loss? There probably is. But to some degree, at what stage do we spend energy trying to find the middle ground? And 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 I think our our our, our, our rush for diversity at all costs, which by the way I, I absolutely agree with, doesn't come without consequences. And it's lovely to think that I that I think absolutely different to you. But if we spend all of our time trying to find a point of commonality that we can agree on, we'll give up on it. It's too hard. Mm. It's too hard. And w would it be fair to say, touching upon, <clears throat> excuse me, the the first the first question from from Juliana, she talked about, well, wanting to 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 make room for diversity, inclusion, and and equity. Is there a case where we might undermine the the company val values? in trying to accommodate each different individual. So actually the company is, is then not really standing for anything. I, I, I think, look, I think, to, I think to some degree, um, uh, you know, I'm thinking about an organization that I've done a lot of work with that have been incredibly successful. They've been incredibly successful. They've been a market leader for 150 years. They've had an amazing product that, that has almost sold itself. They've done an incredible job at establishing themselves as a world leader. And it was interesting, I talked to the CEO today and I said, I find your culture lazy and conflict avoided. And he said to me, you know, why do you think that is? And I said, well, you've been so successful. You don't need, you know, you, you, you don't need to have tough conversations. You don't need to be overly ambitious or um, or competitive. And I mean that, I mean that in a in a in a genuine way. Because you know, and I used the fishing analogy. I said the fish are jumping into the boat. You don't need to do a lot. So I think now, now they're under a bit of pressure, and of course now they've actually had to change a few things. And 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 yeah. a couple of the leadership team are saying, "Oh, we're not comfortable in these conversations." It's interesting. The leaders actually kind of going, "We've been we've been missing these conversations for years because we haven't had to have them." So I think it's an interesting dynamic as the world shifts, as brands change. Um, you know, to what degree the narrative. Now, can we change company culture? Jeez, you know, Bain and Co wrote a paper, it must have been about 10 years ago, it says you want to change the culture, you've got to change the people, do it in under 18 months. And can we change subgroup culture, which I think is more predominant? Absolutely, I believe that we can. Absolutely. You know, do we have the courage to do it? Do we have the, are we prepared to sacrifice our personal comfort to do it? Now, that's the money question. And most people will go, no. Most people, most people in my experience will go, no. there'll be a limit to what I am prepared to sacrifice for a greater good at the uncomfortable expense of myself. And I think that's reasonable. Where, where's the line? Where's the line that I should be crossing? I don't know. Where, but, you know, I think that, that you know, someone's kind of go, this is not working for me anymore. I need to go anywhere. And I totally agree with that. But I think, I think uh, you know, J J Julianne, Julianne asked a really great question about, you know, she prompts me to ask, like, where's that personal sacrifice point where I will tolerate for a greater good? 
versus where I where, where I will say no thanks I will not I will not do that and as human beings and especially senior human beings that I've actually found that have been quite successful they can almost be quite rigid about their approach and their opinion and almost get more narrow than being broad more closed than being open more at risk than than being wanting to be generous sacrificing less because there's more at stake and and, and as I heard one of them say recently, by the way, I've been successful before, you know, I know how this works. And I reminded the person, you may be successful somewhere else, which I don't doubt, but you have never worked here. You have actually never worked in, in this organisation, in this environment, with this tribe, with this dynamic. And, and maybe it will work. Maybe your overlay of your secret source, which I have no doubt worked well, will work. But I, I'm concerned that you're not curious and sceptical. Talk about macro culture fit, but also micro subcultures within a, a company. Can there, within a, a company culture, can there be varying subcultures within that same overall culture? Oh, absolutely, no doubt. Absolutely, no doubt. You know, I, you know, to quote to quote the great Bob Hogan, you know, it's this is anthropology. We're born to thrive in tribes, mm. right? The hierarchy decides the leader, and the hierarchy decides the leader based on the currency of success. Mm. And the currency of success, and, and 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 we all value fairness until there's a greater currency that we value more. Sales is a great example. If I'm a rainmaker, and I bring in all the sales or a large part of the sales, I. Everyone bowed out. Everyone bows down to me, even if I'm rude and arrogant. Now, th that's not about whether that's right. That's just a rule. Mm. So you know, so the tribe decides the hierarchy. The hierarchy decides the rules, and the rest of us actually play by the rules, so we don't get kicked out. Right? Yeah. Right? You know, if we if we if we're, re if we're really questioning about you know you know some of the e issues that are going on in the world, go to a dinner party and just say you don't believe in equity or diversity or climate change. See how that gets you. You might be alone very quickly, right? <laughs> you know, or, or assigned as a bit of an outlier, right? Or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever the, you know, the group think of that is. That's, that's very, 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 very um, hierarchical and ingrained into us from a human nature perspective. And I'm not saying we shouldn't change that, but I'm saying we need to be respectful of that because it's in play anyway. And Warren, to me, so many great thoughts and reflections around the, the theme of, of fit, cultural fit, subgroups, differences in terms of also being able to perform. And if you're not aligned with the company values, well, then you might be so confused that getting ahead is difficult. Hogan answers sure. three different uh, to three different needs in terms of your personality. Well, how are you trying to get ahead? How are you trying to get along? But also how are you trying to create meaning with your personality in, in the structural hierarchy that you are in at a workplace? We could go on for hours, but the but time is, is running out. Just for the participants, we'd like to say next time we, we have these shorter format HR pulses, it will be 2nd of May. Uh, it will be on leadership effectiveness versus emergence, something that I know you would likely also be able to, to talk a lot about, Warren, in terms of are you good at just getting up and playing the political game in the hierarchy or are you actually also effective? Warren, do you have any, uh, besides on behalf of Summit, me saying thank you very much for being here, do you have a final thought to uh, to end on? Oh, look, I, I'd, I'd really encourage us to um, uh, understand individuals' core drivers and to probably hold our own a bit looser. That would, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's a challenge for us all and, and uh, work worthy of doing. I think that is a perfect way to, uh, to end this interview. I hope all of you joining in have felt it was worthwhile your time. Thank you very much, Warren, for, for being with us today. Thank you, Adam.